chapter five is called 16 Heirs. The marbled lake lay heavy on the gray lake when Grace Windsor Wexler parked her car in the Westing driveway and strode up the walk ahead of her daughters. Her husband had refused to come, but no matter. Recalling family gossip about a rich uncle, maybe it was a great uncle. Anyway, his name was Sam. Grace had convinced herself that she was the rightful heir. Jake was Jewish, so he could po not possibly be related to Sam Westing. I can't imagine what has become of my silver or of my silver cross, she said, fingering the gold link necklace under her mink stole as she paused to appraise the big house. You know, Angela, we could have the wedding right here. Turtle, where are you wandering off to now? The letter said, never mind. Turtle preferred not to explain how she knew the library could be entered from the French doors on the lawn. The French door was opened by Crow. Although the Sunset Tower's cleaning woman always wore black, here it reminded Grace Wexler to dab at her eyes with a lace handkerchief. This was a house of mourning. The silent crow helped Angela with her coat and nodded the approval of her blue velvet dress with the white collar, collar and cuffs. I'll keep my furs with me, Grace said. She did not want to be taken for one of the poor relatives. Seems rather chilly in here. Turtle, too, complained of the chill, but her mother tugged off her coat to reveal a fluffy, roughly pink party dress Two sizes too large and four inches too long. It was one of Angela's hand-me-downs. Please sit anywhere, the lawyer said without glancing from the envelopes he was sorting at the head of the long t library table. Mrs. Wexler took the chair to his right and motioned to her favorite. Angela sat down next to her mother, removed a trousseau towel from her large tapestry shoulder bag, and took up embroidering the monogrammed D. Slumped in the third chair, Turtle pretended she had never seen this paneled library with its bare and dusty shelves. Suddenly, she sat up with a start. An open coffin draped in bunting rested on a raised platform at the far corner of the room. In it lay the dead man, looking exactly as she found him, except now he was dressed in the costume of Uncle Sam, including the tall hat. Between the waxy hands folded across his chest lay his mother's, her mother's silver cross. Grace Wexler was too busy greeting to the next heir to notice. Why, Doctor D, I had no idea you'd be here, but of course you'll be a member. You'll soon be a member of the family. Come, sit next to your bride to be Turtle. You'll have to move down. D. Denton, dear, I was in a hurry. Brushed a quick kiss on Angela's cheek. He was still wearing his hospital whites. I didn't know this was a pajama party. Turtle said, relinquishing her chair and stomping to the far end of the table. The next heir, short and round, entered timidly, her lips pressed in an impish smile that curved up to what must be pointed ears under her straight, steely hair. Hello, Mrs. Bombach, Angela said. I don't think you've met my fiancé, Denton Deer. You're a lucky man, Mr. Deer. Dr. Deer, Mrs. Wexler corrected her, puzzled by the dressmaker's presence. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Sensing that she was unwelcomed at this end of the room, Flora Bombach walked on. Hi, mind if I sit next to you? I promise not to pull your braid. That's okay. Turtle was hunched over the table, her chin, small chin resting between her crossed arms. From there, she could see everything except the coffin. Grace Wexler dismissed the next heir with an audible tongue click. That distasteful little man didn't even have the sense to remove his silly aviator's cap. Tsk. And what in heaven's name was he doing here? The delivery boy shouted, Let's give a cheer! Otis Amber is here! Turtle laughed. Flora Bombach tittered, and Grace Wexler again clicked her tongue. Tsk. Doug Hu and his father entered slightly, but Sandy gave a hearty, Hi! and a cheery wave. He wore his doorman's uniform, but unlike Otis Amber, carried his hat in his hand. Grace Windsor Wexler was no longer surprised at the odd assortment of heirs, household workers, all, or former employees, she decided. The rich always wanted to, or always reward their servants in their wills, and her Uncle Sam was a generous man. Aren't your parents coming? She asked the older Theodorcus boy as he wheeled his brother into the library. They weren't invited, Theo replied. His son, Chris announced. What did he say? He said it's snowing. Theo and Flora Bombach explained at the same time. 
The ears watched helplessly as the invalid's thin frame was suddenly torn and twisted by convulsions. Only the dressmaker rushed to his side. I know, I know, she simpered. You're trying to tell us about the itsy-bensy snowflings. Theo moved her away. My brother is not an infant, er, is not an infant, and he's not retarded. So please, no more baby talk. Blinking tears away tears, Flora Bombach returned to her seat, that elfin smile still painted on her pained face. Some stared at the afflicted child with morbid fascination, but most turned away. They didn't want to see. Pyramidal tract involvement, then near whispered, trying to impress Angela with his diagnosis. Angela, her face, a mirror to the boy's suffering, grabbed her tapestry bag and hurried out of the room. Why, hello, Judge Ford, proud of her liberalism, Grace Windsor Wexler stood and leaned over the table to shake the black woman's hand. She must be here in some legal capacity, or maybe her mother was a household aid or maid, but one thing was certain, J. J. Ford could no more be related to Samuel W. Westing than Mr. Who. Can't we get started? Mr. Who asked, hoping to get back in time to watch the football game on television. I must return to my restaurant he announced loudly. Sundays are a busy day, and we are accepting, still accepting reservations. Shin Hu's restaurant on the fifth floor of Sunset Tower, specializing in... Doug tugged at his father's sleeve. Not here, Dad. Not in front of the dead. What dead? Mr. Hu had not noticed the open coffin. Now he did. Oh. The lawyer explained that his several heirs had not yet arrived. My wife is not coming, said Mr. Hu. Grace said, Dr. Wexler was called away on an emergency operation. An emergency Packers game in Green Bay, Carol confided to Flora Bombach, who scrunched up her shoulders and tittered behind a plump hand. Then, we are still waiting for one, no, two more, the lawyer said, fumbling his papers in his hands, shaking under the strict scrutiny of the judge. Judge Ford had recognized E.J. Plum several months ago. He had argued before her in court bumbling to the point of incompetence. Why, she wondered, was a young, inexperienced attorney chosen to handle an estate of such importance? Come to think of it, what was she doing here? Curiosity, perhaps. But what about the rest of them, the other tenants of Sunset Towers? Don't anticipate, Josie Joe. Wait for Sam Westing to make the first move. Light footsteps were heard in the hall. It was only Angela, who blushed and, hugging her tapestry bag close to her body, returned to her seat. The heirs waited. Some chatted with neighbors. Some looked up at the gilt ceiling. Some studied the, the pattern of the oriental rug. Judge Ford stared at the table, at Theo, Theodorcus's hand, a callous hand, a healed cut, the shiny slash of a burn on the deep bronze skin. She lowered her hands to her lap. His Greek skin was darker than her black skin. Thump, thump, thump. Someone was coming. Or were there two of them? In came Crow, eyes lowered without a word. She sat down next to Otis Amber. A dark cloud passed from her face as she eased off a tight shoe under the table. Thump, thump, thump. The last expected heir arrived. Hi, everybody. Sorry I'm late. I have quite adjust I haven't quite adjusted to this. Sidel Plasky waved gale a gaily painted crutch in the air, tottered and set it down quickly with another thump. This crutch, crutch, what a horrible word, but I guess I'll have to get used to it. She pursed her bright red mouth, painted to a fullness beyond the narrow line of her lips, trying to suppress a smile of triumph. Everyone was staring. She knew they would notice. What happened, Pulaski? Otis Amber asked. Did you pull Turtle's braid again? More likely, she visited Wexler the foot butcher, Sandy suggested. Seidel was pleased to hear someone come to her defense with a loud click of the tongue. She had not even blinked a false eyelash at those offensive remarks. Poise, they call it. It's really nothing, she reported bravely, just some sort of wasting disease, but pity me not. I shall live out my remaining time enjoying each precious day to the full. Thump, thump, thump. The secretary kept to the side of the room, avoiding the oriental rug that might cushion the thump of her purple-striped crutch as she made her way to the end of the table. Her exaggerated hips were even more exaggerated by the wavy stripes of, her pur of white on her purple dress. Purple waves, Turtle thought. Denton Deer was, or almost fell off his chair, leaning back to follow this most unusual case. First she favored her left leg, then her right leg. What is it? whispered Mrs. Wexler. The intern did not have the least 
notion, but he had to say something. Traveling sporadic myostis, he pronounced quickly and glanced at Angela. Her eyes remained on her embroidery. The lawyer stood, documents in hand, cleared his throat several times. Grace Windsor Wexler, chin tilted in the regal position of an heiress, gave him her full attention. One minute, please, Seidel Pulaski propped her purple and white crutch against the table, then removed a shorthand pad and pencil from her handbag. Thank you for waiting. You may begin. And chapter six is The Westing Will. <laughs>